welcome those that joined us over the internet. I continue to be amazed at the response we have, and questions and so forth. Uh, probably don't notice sometimes, but uh, unless I mention it, but a lot of the messages that I do are in response to questions that I've gotten, or inquiries about things that we teach and believe. And uh, I always appreciate people when they contact me and uh, let me know they're listening. And uh, we've had several people that have gotten saved uh, listening to the broadcast. And uh, I just appreciate the outlet that we have to be able to share with others uh, the glorious truth of the gospel. All right, I want you to turn me today to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and I'm, I'm going to talk about, somebody asked me not to speak about just fathers, because they said it, they'd put them on a guilt trip. Uh, actually, Genesis chapter 2, I won't say who that was. But anyway, I'll talk to you about the home in general. And I used to do this more frequently, and I haven't in a long time. But I believe there's some biblical truths that we should be aware of, and not only be aware of, but that we should take heed to. And uh, I think there are things that uh, are unchangeable. And I know that society has changed, and uh, most of religion has changed. And I'm not going to worry about being, I mean, try to get politically correct or uh, anything like that. This is not to condemn anybody. But I just want to point out some scriptural facts. And everything that we mention, we will use scripture. And uh, generally, uh, basically what I want to talk about are the roles of the man, the woman, and also the children. Uh, God ordained the family. And we find that in Genesis chapter 2. I told you 3, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, in verse 18, the Bible says, The Lord God said... It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now there we have the creation of the woman, and it's clear, uh, certain things are clear there. She came out of man, and I know the theologists and so forth today, there's a lot of them that deny the truth of the first ten books of Genesis are a large part of Genesis. What I find uh, interesting, though, is that verse 24 is the only verse in your Bible that is in the Old Testament, in the four Gospels, and in Paul's epistles. And that is, a man, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So God instituted marriage, uh, instituted the home there between man and woman. And of course they're instructed to bring forth children. Uh, over in chapter 3, after the temptation, uh, in verse 16, or verse 15, uh, the Bible says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, speaking to Satan, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, that is her seed, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall, be, he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of the, which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, 
and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. Now in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, we see the instructions to Adam and Eve there in the garden. We see their rebellion against that. And we see what God's punishment was, His judgment, was to cast them out of that garden. He said, the day you take thereof, you shall surely die. Well, they didn't die physically, they died spiritually. And from that time forward, there has been a curse upon the earth. Things did not turn out as God planned, but He, had, he allowed man to have a free will and man chose at every turn to rebel against God so that when you get over to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And of course Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when they came off the ark, he gave, gave the same uh, uh, instructions to Noah as he did to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. And so from that came all the generations of mankind. Now I know that most of science says that the earth is millions and millions of years old, but uh, uh, whether you consider it old folk or not, I believe the Bible account. And I believe that the earth is probably around 6,000 years old. Maybe a little older, I don't know. But the fact is, is that God gave specific instructions. And you can go all the way through the Old Testament. Of course, in the Old Testament, uh, men took numerous wives. I forget how many it was Solomon had, but it was a whole bunch. And, uh, but when we get over to uh, the ministry of Christ, uh, he addresses marriage. He also addresses divorce. Uh, Paul addresses marriage. He addresses divorce. And even in the Old Testament, there was a writing of divorcement. So don't ever look down your nose at people that divorce. It's not part of God's plan, but it is something that people have, it happens to people. And uh, there are grounds for it. And so... We're not going to deal with that today. But the fact is, is that God established the home upon a man and a woman and the children that they brought forth. Now, in those particular areas of life, there are specific instructions for the husbands. There are specific instructions for the wives. And there are specific instructions for the children. And so I want us to look at some of those. And uh, I want you to notice the instructions that are given. Uh, go, if you will, first of all, uh, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. That is, all the things that he had taught them. Uh, he had been to Corinth when he wrote this letter back to them. And keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. And so there in that one short verse, we have again the order that God created. There's God, there's Christ, there's man, and there's woman. And in that picture, we see what God's design was. And so for each one of those entities, each one of those positions... As I said a moment ago, there are specific instructions. But one of the things that society has tried to do today is destroy 
the uniqueness of the roles of men and women. Men and women. Uh, I heard somebody say one time, if man, if a husband and a wife were exactly the same, one of them would be unnecessary. And uh, I don't think you can really deny, if you just look around, the differences. I mean, you stop and think about uh, when you were a child, when you hurt yourself, did you run to your daddy? No, you went to your mama. Because your daddy would say, shake it off. You know, put a bandage on it. Mama would act like it was the end of the world. You know, she'd get you up, cuddle it, doctor it and everything else. And two or three later, days later, she'd still be talking about it. There's differences. And, they, I mean, you could just go on and on about the difference. I heard a comedian the other day talking about the four, four most dreaded words in the life of a man. And those are, we need to talk. I remember coming home from work and Mary say, Steve, we need to talk. And I think, Mary, I forgot something. I need to go back to work. <laughs> and through life, I, I have just, the, the things just stand out. Mary had our surgery back in 2016. She had her Achilles heel repaired and she could not put weight on it for six weeks, six months, something like that. And so I had to do all the household chores. Little did I know that you couldn't put all the clothes in the, dish, uh, in the washing machine at one time. You had to put the blue jeans in one load, and you had to put the towels in another load, and you had to put the dainties in another load. I put them all in there, washed them on hot, had pink t-shirts and everything else come out of there. I, Wash most of the dishes by hand. We got a dishwasher, and so one day I got brave and I loaded the dishwasher. I look up, come in the kitchen, and Mary's on that one leg, bent over, rearranging everything I put in the dishwasher. Little did I know all the big plates had to be lined up with their buddies, and all the little plates had to be lined up with their buddies. And all the bowls had a certain place, and heaven forbid that a fork got in the same container with a knife. <laughs> Never saw anything like it. I said, just turn the sucker on, it'll wash them. And then she turned it on a cycle that lasts 199 minutes. I've been washing them on rinse. I mean, if you can't see nothing on them, they're good to me. And besides that, I found out I gotta wash them before I put them in there. She's got a little brush here. She scrapes them. But I've got her now. Because when she sleeps late in the morning, I put them in there with eggs crusted and everything else. And then I go ahead and run it before she gets up. And I tell her, say, look how clean these are. She said, no, they didn't run long enough. You can't see a spot on them. We're different, folks. We have different roles. Different personalities. Different ways of doing things. Women generally like to talk more than men do. All of my kids and grandkids make fun of me because they send me a page-long email and I'll respond and say, yes. Well, would you like to elaborate? No. <laughs> I don't see how they come up with all that stuff they write. But the fact is that we're different. But there's some things that we're instructed that we need to acknowledge and understand. Look over in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'll pick on the husbands first. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, our Apostle, has some very uh, specific instructions. Now, what I think you need to keep in mind is sometimes as in preaching grace and preaching it as hard and as strong as we can, and trying to make it clear to people that works have nothing to do with their salvation. If you're not saved, there's nothing you can do in your flesh to merit salvation. There's nothing you can do in your flesh to gain salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God, and it is given to every person that will believe the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and received the free gift of salvation. That's salvation. And we... There is nothing 
that I, I made a statement several weeks ago. And I had written, put this on Facebook. And I, on the, and then, I know people might take offense to this. But in there I said no matter how much disdain you may have for the homosexual community or the transgender community, if you believe that lifestyle will keep a person out of heaven, you don't understand grace. And I stand by that. Because folks, what is done in the flesh is flesh. And salvation is of the heart and of the mind and of the spirit. And so we need to get that straight. We may not like it, might not agree with the lifestyle, whatever the situation. But the fact is, it's the same gospel saves every person on planet earth if they're willing to accept it, believe it, and receive it. After that, we read in Paul's 13 epistles about that salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then you get over like to a book of Ephesians. And the first three chapters deal specifically with doctrine and truth concerning who we are in Christ and how we got there and what, 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 our, what the, the, our destiny is and so forth. But then the last four chapters, four, five, and six, deal with our walk. When I say our walk, I'm talking about our life. There are instructions about how we ought to live. And the thing is, is these things are as relevant today, many of them are as relevant today as they were the day they were written. I remember years ago, I've told this before, about my niece that was visiting with us, and she said she didn't like her Sunday school teacher. They had moved up to Knoxville, and she said she didn't like her Sunday school teacher. And I said, why not? She said, well, he teaches that a woman ought to be in submission to a man. I said, well, that's what the Bible says. She said, yeah, but that was for back then. I said, well, when did it change? She said, oh, you just got to get with the time, Steve. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting, now notice verse 21, a lot of people overlook this one, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now I've known men in my lifetime that took verse 22 and plucked it out and wrote it in stone and put it up in their house and it didn't go any further than that. And they demanded that their wife be in submission to them. And they were mean about it. And cruel in some instances. And that they were the ruler of that house. And the wife ought to do whatever they say and so forth. And they completely ignore verse 24 and 25. Which says, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands... Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, man, let me ask you something. What is it that you find in the Bible that the Lord Jesus Christ makes us do? He instructs us on what to do. But does he hold a rod of iron above us and if we don't obey him, he punishes us? We just did a lesson a couple of weeks ago about how God's not chastening people today in the sense that religion teaches it. We're living the dispensation of grace. God is merciful. God is loving, long-suffering, kind, merciful. He desires for us to obey His Word. But He doesn't punish us if He doesn't, and He doesn't make us do it. And so that's the kind of love that Christ has for the church. And Paul says, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands and everything, but there's a statement there, husbands love your wives. I've never found a, a, a situation that I know of personally, I'm sure they exist, but I've never known a situation personally where a husband loved his wife like Christ loved the church, that the woman 
wouldn't be in submission. I'm sure there are those that do. I mean, everybody's got a sinful nature. But the fact is, there's a... Remember, the verses didn't have numbers on them when Paul wrote them. So there's a thought here of the submission as he outlined in 1 Corinthians. I had, a, I had a woman one time attended church here, bless her heart. She was uh, lived up on a, in the Lexington Village up on Signal Mountain. And uh, she was uh, almost totally blind. She could see figures and stuff. And uh, so I would go pick her up every Sunday morning for church. Betty, what was her name? Anyway. Betty Bailey, and uh, that's the woman over there got a memory. Uh, <laughs> so she, asked, she she said, I remember driving home one day, she said, Brother Steve, I wish I had seen this truth when I could still read. And so she, I got her some, I bought her a set of, uh, I believe it was Alexander Scorby, reading the New Testament on cassette tape. She would listen to those things. Well, she got in the car one Sunday morning, and she said, Steve, I want to ask you something. She said, uh, why was Paul a woman hater? I said, Paul who? She said, the Apostle Paul. Why was he a woman hater? I said, what are you talking about, man? She said, well, I was listening to some ladies in a ladies' Bible study here at the home, and the lady said, Paul was a woman hater. So the next week, I said, well, I'll cover that next week. And I pointed out all the verse where Paul it, uh, praises women, like in Romans 16, those that were helpers in the faith and so forth. Paul's never a woman hater. Paul's writing by inspiration. And so he tells the husbands, love your wife. And not only that, he tells them to love their wife as Christ loved the church. Think about that. He, was with, he, he says you ought to be willing to die for your wife. Lay down your life. The supreme love. Love her like you love your own body. In Ephesians 5, 28, So all men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Brother Jerry Lockhart tells a story about a man came into his office out there in New Braunfels, Texas. And it said he wanted, to, wanted Jerry to marry him and his girlfriend. And they were together and they came in to talk to Jerry about the marriage and he asked the man sitting there, he said, let me ask you something. If you're walking across the street out there on Lambda Road or Lambda Drive and a car was coming and you both couldn't get out of the way, would you push her out of the way and die for her? And he said, no. He said, well, I'm not going to marry you then. <coughs> yeah, I said, you're not what? <laughs> and so... Jerry read the verse to him. I think he eventually married him. But the point was is that men, the, the love that man ought to have for his wife is a sacrificial love. It's like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's love that their wives like their own bodies. Because he said, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. And part of that love has to do with providing for them. Look over in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Again, instructions. Very practical instructions. Not about doctrine of salvation, baptism, or anything else. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul tells Timothy, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, that means to repay them, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. That she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, and yet, and these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. 
It is the man's responsibility to provide for the family. Now, I know we live in a society where over the years it has evolved such that it's hard to live on one income, but the primary responsibility for seeing that the needs are met for the household lie with the man. That's what it says. If any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel. <coughs> and I believe Paul's talking about a time where there were men who just wouldn't work. Matter of fact, he addresses it over in Thessalonians. He said, there are those who are idle and refuse to work. He said, don't company with them. And if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. I mean, with one swoop of the pan, Paul did away with the welfare system. Of course, in the Bible days, we read right here how it was taken care of. Families took care of families. The younger took care of the elderly. Why? Because the elderly were instructed back in Corinthians to lay up for the younger. A lot of kids, they want to read 1 Corinthians and say, you need to be laying up money for me, but they forget about the fact that when you do, it needs to be used to take care of the elder. Well, I probably ought to get off that. I always found it easier to preach that when I was younger, but uh, at my age, I don't want to put any burden on my children. Anyway, they're, there's a provi they're, they're the provider. They're to take the position as the head of the household, head of the family. Uh, but they're to do that in a role that is loving, kind, compassionate, uh, and long-suffering, just like Christ loves the church. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, in verse 18, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it's fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. You know, I understand that verse for a long time. And I told the story before many times about Mary and I and our marriage. And she doesn't mind me doing this because it illustrates something I think is very important. But there came a time in our marriage that uh, I didn't think, I, I, I told Mary I didn't love her anymore. And she said, were well, you going to leave me? I said, no, I can't do that. I got to provide. I said, but I just, you, the love is just gone. And so we were a real stalemate. And it finally dawned on me, and Mary and I had agreed when our first child was born, Stephanie was born, that she would stay home with the kids. And no matter what it took, I would support the family. And so I was working two jobs at that time. I'd get home from work and changed clothes and I went, I had a, two or three apartment complexes. I did repair work and painting and all that kind of stuff. I'd go work probably at nine or 10 o'clock and come home and it, I developed a bitterness. And I finally understood that verse, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. You see, sometimes the responsibility of a man can be overwhelming to it. And so, when we decided, after Stephanie was born, Mary said, now I can go back to work. But she said, if I do, then we need to agree that you'll do as much work here at the house as I do because it'll be equally shared. I didn't have to think about that too long. I said, no, you stay home. I'll get two jobs. I mean, after changing one diaper, I knew that was not for me. <laughs> And so that's the decision we made. And I became bitter. And over a period of time, I've told the story before, I was in West Tennessee and focused on the family was on. And there was a preacher on there that James Dobson was interviewing. And this man was talking about when you come to a point in your marriage and you don't believe you love each other anymore. He said, don't quit. You made a commitment, stand by it. And he said, I want to give you men some advice. He said, if you don't think you love your wife, if you think that your love is dead and you don't love her anymore, I want to give you an exercise to do. And I'll almost guarantee it 99% to work. 
He said, you go back and start doing the things for your wife that you did when you were dating. You take her out, go to a movie, go out and eat, help her at the house, do whatever. In other words, act like you're just trying to win her over. And he said, if you're saying in your heart you can't do it, don't do that because the Lord never told you to do anything that you can't do. And the Lord told you to love your wife like Christ loved the church. Therefore, you can do it. And he said, the problem you have in your mind is you associate love with lust and uh, uh, feeling. And love is neither. Love is an action. Christ loved the church and gave himself for. And you know what, folks? I started doing that. And over a period of time, our marriage was renewed. And we went one time to some marriage counselors. We were having a difficult time. And I said, Mary, you know what? With our background, we're not going to get a divorce. We might as well try to get some help because we're going to live together. I hate giving you misery like this. So we went for counseling. <clears throat> After about two sessions, we realized we knew more than he did, so we quit and <laughs> made up and was happy afterwards. It's all in the Bible, folks. It's there. It's just that our rotten, stinking flesh doesn't want to obey it. We want to rebel. So the husbands have the responsibility as being the head of the home and not being bitter and loving their wife as Christ loved the church. And women, they need to recognize their, the responsibility of the man, the position of the man. Now, it, it, let me say this. You know, when we talk about being in submission, some people think about immediately that the man's in charge of everything. Listen, if the man decides that he wants his wife to take care of the checkbook, she ought to take care of the checkbook. I never made that decision. But if a man doesn't make that decision, he ought to be generous with his wife, kind and so forth. Bible says the woman ought to have a meek and a quiet spirit. Uh, she's to be in submission to the man. Titus 2, 5 says she's to be a keeper at home. In other words, she's the one to direct the house and so forth. And I understand today that men sometimes take the role of stay-at-home dads and uh, all of that kind of stuff. But I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. Look over in Titus chapter 2. It's a very interesting chapter. And it's written to obviously Titus, who was over the church there at Crete. And so the first thing Paul tells him is that he needs to ordain elders in every city. And then he tells him, starting in chapter 2, verse 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the age of women likewise, that they be in behaviors, becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. So all you older women, you have a ministry. If you've got daughters, if you've got people that look up to you, you need to teach them. And what do you teach them? You teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, it cannot be condemned. He that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say of you. And he talks about the servants and so forth. And in verse 11 he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. So the fact is, is that we need to deal with one another, husband and wife, with grace, with love, with compassion. And then there are the children. Look in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6. It's a continuation of chapter 5 there. Let's just go back to chapter 5 and finish reading what we read there. Uh, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. 
For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's the verse in Genesis, from Genesis chapter 2. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and the mother, which is the first commandment with promise. I was watching a video last night on YouTube. It was called Father's Discipline. The fellow went to his daughter's room and opened the door and she said, didn't you hear your mother call you? And she said, well, I was busy. And she said, close my door when you go out. He closed the door, came back with a hammer and a screwdriver, took the hinges off the door and Ruth took it with him. <laughs> he said, you need to know who's in charge at this house. And she just squalled in the back room. You can't do this to me. I've got to have my privacy. He said, no, you don't. Give me your phone. Now, you take the phone away from a teenager, you might as well cut your hand off. <laughs> but you know what? He put down in the caption there. This may seem hard and this might seem harsh, but guess what? It works. You see, sometimes it's hard to be the disciplinary. But I look back on my life and I thank God that my dad was as mean, not mean, that it was as strict as he was. Because I was a rebellious sort. And he would whip me. I probably have to over told this story, but I remember the last time that I lied to him. I was about 12 years old. And it was over something so insignificant. Because we had a popsicle truck that came by every day, and I got a popsicle. And when I got through, I'd wrap the wrapper around the stick and just throw it there, yard in the corner of the garage or whatever. He told me, he said, uh, "You know we got a trash can in the backyard, don't you?" I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "Don't ever throw that on the ground again." Of course, he was military, drill instructor. And so. Next day, the popsicle truck came, and I got my popsicle, and I wrapped the paper around the stick, stuck it behind the gutter in the house. Now, I was, I'm mean, 10, 11, 12 years old, and I could have walked around that house in 15 seconds. And my sister told on me. And so we're sitting there eating supper. My dad was always a very calm person. And he said, son, we're going to have to go outside and help him talk after supper. I knew he didn't want to talk. And he went out there and he took his pocket knife out and he cut a limb off a peach tree. And they got those little old bitty spurs like that and he started shaving the leaves off. And he said, there's one thing I'll never tolerate as long as you live under my roof and that's you tell me a lie. And he blistered my legs. Memorial Day came around and that's when the swimming pool opened. And I was excited to death. I was on the swim team there on the air base where we lived. And I put my swimming trucks on. I looked around the other, and I had whelps across the back of my legs. And I was so embarrassed I wouldn't go swimming. And I told my dad, told my mom first that she had sympathy. And she heard her in it. You shouldn't have beat that boy like that. But you know what? I never lied to him again. One other time he was working down Fort Payne at the state park there. And so he would leave on Monday and he was park ranger through Thursday and he'd come home on Friday. And the first week we was out of school, I was 12 years old. And uh, I said, when are we gonna get to, when am I gonna get to go to my grandmother's house? He said, well, probably not because uh, we just got the one car and I've got to take it to work every week. And uh, I said, well, I'm bored. That was on Friday night. Well, I wish I'd never uttered those words. <laughs> Next morning, I woke up, and there's about six gallons of stain. Y'all remember cedar shakes on the front of houses? And it had wood trim. He'd come out, and he said, he got you. I bought you a present. 
I said, what's that? He said, this step ladder and these six paintbrushes and these six gallons of paint and stain. He said, you won't be bored anymore this summer. <laughs> and so, I mean, we're down in Birmingham. It's 100 degrees every day. So I'd get up about sunrise and go out there and paint and stain those shakes. You know, I think I'd be done. The next day I'd look at those shakes. They need another coat. There's just stuff just sinking into them. But it taught me a lesson. I didn't complain about being bored anymore. <laughs> you see, today, if people treated their children like my dad treated me, and my mom, she wasn't too strict. I mean, I'd get by with most stuff with her, but my dad was. And he'd probably get arrested today. Seriously. But I look back on that and I thank, I thank God, not only for my dad, but for Christian parents. He got saved when I was three years old. He was a drunk, a womanizer, and an alcoholic. And he went to a revival meeting and got saved and never touched alcohol again. He wasn't able to quit the tobacco. He had such a, he said it was 10 times as hard to quit smoking as it was to quit drinking. And he finally did quit smoking, but he dipped snuff. And everybody told him it's going to kill you. Chew tobacco. Sure enough, it did at 84. Got him. But he was a, he was a kind individual. But he believed in discipline. And he believed in bringing your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And listen, young people, you may think your parents are nuts. I know you do sometimes. Young people may be listening here, whatever. They have your best interest. There is nobody on planet Earth that loves you like your parents do. There is nobody that has your interest at heart any more than your parents do. And parents, we need to realize and understand. Maybe somebody out here listening to this that needs this. Your kids don't need you to be their friend. They need you to be their parent. They need you to instruct them and teach them. I mean, the brain doesn't even fully develop until they're about 24 years old, and then some of them are just half. But the fact is, young people, young people need, they need instruction. That's why the Bible tells us that. And I know people do mature at different ages and so forth, but the fact is, God Almighty set some things in order. And you know what? Every bit of it. Is based on love. Notice what Paul said. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise. I believe that's two different instructions. I believe the children would be those that are under your care. But once they leave home, listen, if your parents are still alive, you need to pay attention to verse 2. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. I love to see people whose parents are getting older that care for them, that love them. I'm very fortunate along those lines. But you should never get too old that you don't honor your parents. I've seen things posted this weekend on Facebook about parents and I know some of these people personally, and I know that they had a difficult upbringing. And in some situations, their fathers were very, very harsh. But now, in almost every case, I see where people write and say, he was hard on me, but I'm so thankful he was. It's not an easy job to be a parent. It's not an easy job to be a child. It's not an easy job to be a husband or a wife. But God has given us some instructions. And if we base it on love, the love that Christ had for us when he gave himself and died for us, then it makes it much easier. And I would encourage you to read and study what the Bible has to say about the family. God, Paul says a lot about it, and there's a lot of instructions in there. And we need to take heed to it. I appreciate you being here today. Again, I wish all the fathers a <coughs> happy Father's Day. And I hope that if your dad's alive and you're not with him today that you'll call him tell him how much you appreciate him. Would you stand with me for prayer?
Father, we thank you today for your love and your mercy and your grace toward us. We thank you for all that we have and in you, all the spiritual blessings that we have. We thank you for those that loved us and brought us up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we just pray that you'd help us as older folks to be examples to those that are younger. And to, when we do have to use discipline, so that we do it with love and compassion and long-suffering. But that we would always do all that we do in the spirit of love and mercy. For your name we pray. Amen. Thank beer today. We're dismissed. Well, everybody wish we brought a happy birthday on the way out. Today is LeBron's birthday. Well, I would say happy birthday, but.